Welcome to the Automotive Diagnostic Podcast. We're going to explore ways to sharpen our diagnostic skills, find learning resources, and hear from experts in the automotive field. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the Automotive Diagnostic Podcast. My name's Sean Tipping. I'll be your host today. Thanks so much for tuning in. Today on the show, I'm going to take you through another case study. Today's case study is going to be a 2007 Dodge Nitro, and this was a communications network problem with this vehicle. Uh, I was called in to look at this because it was a no communication, no crank, and obviously no start vehicle uh, that they had been messing around with at this shop for a while and not making a ton of progress as far as what the fix was to get this thing going again. And uh, luckily it was a hard fault um, that actually makes these quite a bit easier to determine what's wrong as opposed to a, you know, intermittent issue with the network, which could be much more difficult to peg down what the cause is. Uh, This one was constant. It was all the time. So I come in and of course, the first thing that I want to do is confirm what's going on. And it was pretty easy to confirm on this one. You turn the key on, there's some lights that come on the dash, but uh, there's nothing when you turn the key, no click, no nothing. And I plug my scan tool in and I did find that there was some communication issues uh, with some of the modules on the vehicle. And I'll go through what those modules were as we progress through this. But uh, there were some interesting things on this case study that I thought would be good to point out as far as what process you take uh, when you have a communication issue um, and some different things that we need to be aware of on networks uh, that we want to figure out, you know, before we dive into these. So hopefully this will be helpful. But um, The first thing for me, I ask myself, I have a few questions that I ask myself when I get into a network problem, when I have communication issues with a vehicle. One of those is going to be which modules are no communication. And that sounds simple enough, but I always want to know, am I dealing with one specific module that's not communicating? Or do I have multiple modules that are not communicating? And that's going to change my path significantly on which way I'm going to go. Because if I only have one, I'm probably going to attack that module. Go to it, check powers, grounds, communication, and that that's it. But if I have multiple modules that don't communicate, now I want to ask myself, okay, how many modules uh, are not communicating with my scan tool or the rest of the vehicle? And are they all present on the same network? Okay, do they all exist within the same network on that car? And that leads me into my next question is how many networks are present on this vehicle? You know, maybe it's an older vehicle. Maybe there's only one. Uh, Maybe there's two. Maybe there's three. Uh, We see multiple networks used on a lot of vehicles. So I want to know, you know, which network these are on. And of course, are they all on the same network? A lot of times that is the case. And then I want to ask myself, what's the network configuration? What are we dealing with here? Is it a single wire, uh, like a GM Class 2? Is it two wires, CAN bus? Depending on the network configuration, it is going to change how I attack the problem. So these are the questions that are running through my mind um, as I'm going into this. Again, that's which modules are no communication. If it's multiple, are they all on the same network? How many networks are present on this vehicle? And what's the network configuration specifically of the network that I have a communication issue with. Um, I will say, so this is a Chrysler vehicle and it's a CAN bus Chrysler vehicle. Using the factory Y-Tech software, um, which you can actually do through a J2534 application, or you can use it with a factory Micropod 2, uh, they do have a uh, network topology, which is live feedback of the entire vehicle, all the networks on the vehicle, it's going to show it to you on a screen and the modules will be either blue, green, or yellow. If they're communicating, they're present on the vehicle. They'll be red if they're not communicating. And it will actually even show you which modules are optional on that vehicle and we're not equipped. So sometimes you have control modules that 
that was an option for that vehicle from the factory, but it wasn't actually equipped uh, when that one rolled off the assembly line. So it'll be grayed out. And I, I didn't use the YTEC in this application. Uh, I've been using YTEC on a short-term subscription basis lately. So I was actually using the Autel here, but I wanted to point out if you have the ability to use the YTEC here, um, this makes diagnosing network problems very, very simple because you get a quick live visual of what's going on in the network. And other vehicles will actually have this as well. But again, I was just using the Autel here, and this is an older 908. It's not the Ultra. I think the Ultra has something similar as far as the live network monitor goes. But I'm going to walk you through this um, with uh, older Autel that does not have this live network capability. So just to point out, the Ytech would have made this a little bit easier here, but we could still figure it out regardless of the tools that we're using. So back to my first question, which modules are no communication? I found that it was the PCM, the ABS, the airbag control, transmission control, the scream or the security, and a theft module. Those were all no communication. Um, also, there were some other ones. The Autel on its auto scan will basically go through all the modules. And <laughs> if it doesn't communicate with a module during the auto scan, which is pulling all the DTCs from all the modules, it just sort of throws it off the screen and it's gone. And I was watching as it was going through and it threw off the shift lever control module, steering angle sensor or control module, occupant classification uh, control module, which is passenger presence. And those three modules, the shift lever, the steering angle, and the occupant classification, I'm not 100% sure if they're equipped on this vehicle or not right at this moment. But I do know it has a powertrain control module. I do know it has ABS. I do know it has airbag, anti-theft, and assuming it a transmission control module. But um, those other three, I don't know if they're actually equipped. And again, that's where the YTEC would come in handy because it would show me right on the screen because it's connected to Chrysler's server and it has the VIN punched in already. It would show me whether those modules were equipped on there or not, where the Autel doesn't necessarily do that. Another advantage of the factory scan tool. But again, um, at least I have an idea here of what I can't communicate with. The modules I can talk with are the TIPM, which is the totally integrated power control module under the hood, and a number of modules on the interior of the vehicle, such as the instrument cluster and various other modules on the interior of the vehicle. And I'll, I'll lay this out for you in a little bit here, but I can talk with some modules on the vehicle, but not those ones that I mentioned. So with the modules that I mentioned, now here's where I need to do a little bit of research to tell, are they all on the same network? And this is an important step when you're doing network communication diagnosis is to really understand how the network or networks are set up on the vehicle that you are working on. Even if you work on you know the same brand all the time, um, throughout the years they can change how these vehicles are set up. And before I go into a diagnosis of anything, I really want to have a good understanding of how this network is set up. Now, you can read the description and operation uh, within your service information, and sometimes that will provide you with some uh, good information on how this is working. But what I like to do right off the bat is just take a look at the wiring diagrams for the communication network or networks on a vehicle. And a lot of times, sometimes I'll go with factory diagrams. Sometimes I'll use the color redrawn diagrams. Um, the nice part about the color redrawn diagrams that you would find in, heck, you can find them in Mitchell, all that, and Identifix nowadays. They're not factory. They can definitely have errors. Or what I found out in this one, they actually leave out some connectors, uh, which I want to see where the connectors are in the diagram. But it gives me a good idea on one page or maybe two of the entire network configuration and how this thing is set up. So on this vehicle, there's actually three different CAN networks that are used. And there's a LIN bus as well. I'm not so concerned about that at the moment. But 
There are three CAN bus. So CAN bus, again, is going to be a two-wire communication system uh, that's going to use a CAN high and CAN low twisted pair of wires that connects to multiple uh, modules on a network. But we've got three to deal with here. So I need to identify which networks are which and where my modules that I cannot communicate with are located. Which network are they on? So first we have an interior CAN. And the interior CAN is going to run everything. I shouldn't say everything, but most of the body functions for the vehicle that are not critically important to the operation of the vehicle. Not to say they couldn't disable something important, but this is not going to be stuff like your analog brakes and your powertrain control module and your transmission control. That that stuff's you know very important to the operation of the vehicle. That's going to be on a different bus that we'll talk about. But we have our interior bus um, that is going to be things like the instrument cluster, the door control modules, the HVAC control, things like that. And then we're going to have the high speed, or you could say it's the powertrain can, um, but it is the high speed can. It's actually going to use uh, the same setup. Both of these are can networks, but the high speed is going to be exactly what it says. It's going to be a higher rate of communication between these modules so they can transfer information very quickly uh, in order to get information from one module to another. And this high speed can is going to include the modules that I'm looking for, which is the PCM, ABS, airbag control, transmission control module, anti-theft, and again, the shift lever, steering angle, and occupant classification uh, if they're equipped on this particular vehicle. But this is where all my modules that I can't talk with are located on, is on the high-speed or CAN-C network of this vehicle. So we've got two separate CAN buses, but actually there's a third one. And it's important to note that this third one is present before we jump into the diagnostics. And that's exactly what that's actually what this one is called is a diagnostic CAN. There is a small CAN network, which is just two wires, that goes between the DLC where you plug in your scan tool and our gateway module. And what a gateway module is, is a module that is basically a hub or a gateway for multiple networks on a vehicle. So at certain points, information needs to be crossed over from the interior CAN to our high-speed CAN or the other way around. Our gateway module is connected to both networks and is able to cross data in between those two networks. But it also is going to act as a hub for your scan tool. Okay, so what that means is when you plug into the DLC with your scan tool, you are connected to the gateway module only, not physically connected to either the high speed or the interior CAN bus. And that's important to note because a lot of times we do some testing right from the DLC, whether it be an ohm check or hooking up a breakout box and looking at the scope patterns. We do this often from our DLC. And in this case, you wouldn't be able to do that because of this diagnostic can. And Chrysler's not the only manufacturer that uses this. I've seen this on other vehicles. And heck, I should say some Chrysler's don't use a diagnostic can. Some of them are actually hardwired to the DLC. Uh, GM typically is hardwired to the DLC, so you, you can jump right into the network from your DLC. Um, that's not the case here. So we need to be aware of that, and that's what I was talking about, understanding the network configuration, understanding how this vehicle is set up. And if you look at a diagram, pull this diagram up, you can clearly see that it, it even says on the diagram, even on the redrawn one, that it is a diagnostic can, and it only goes between our gateway module, and our DLC. So our scanner is going through this module in order to communicate with the rest of the vehicle. And that's important to note because if we want to do any scope testing or circuit testing, we're going to have to go to the network. We can't do it from the DLC. So I should note, what is the gateway module on this vehicle? Well, it is the TIPM. And I was able to communicate with the TIPM when I did my initial auto scan of the vehicle. And there happen to be multiple communication codes in the TIPM. So what we know now is that there's three separate networks, one of them just for the scan tool. 
We can communicate with our TIPM, who is connected to both networks. We can't talk to anything else on our high speed CAN C, but we can talk to everything on our interior CAN. So now we know what network we need to attack, and we're getting an idea of how the networks are set up on this vehicle. And one other thing I should point out here that was kind of a giveaway even before I did any of the module scans was that the cooling fans were running nonstop under the hood when you had the key on. And this is a giveaway in a lot of vehicles that, especially Nissan and Chrysler, that the PCM is not on the network or in this case that nothing can talk on our high speed can see network. Uh, it's a default strategy because the the way it's supposed to work is the PCM sends a signal to, in this case, the tip them to say, hey, I need cooling fan operation, the engine's overheating. But when communication is down and the tip them recognizes that, it's just going to say, okay, I'm going to turn on the fans all the time uh, in order to protect the engine from any possible overheating because I can't recognize whether that's happening or not. Now, in this case, the engine isn't running. So, of course, that's not going to happen, but it's a giveaway to us as a technician that our communication is down, particularly with the PCM. Uh, in Chrysler's, if you have an interior can issue where there's a communication, you're going to see the wipers that are going to move. Uh, they're going to be on constantly. Again, this is a default strategy. If the communication bus is down for the interior can, one of the things that is controlled through this communication is windshield wiper operation. Well, communication's down. We're just going to run those wipers constantly as a safety default in case it's raining and you need wipers. And, you know, you can't do it because there's a communication issue. Um, anyways, just a couple of giveaways there on Chrysler's. And I know Nissan's are the same way. You get those fans running all the time. Uh, make sure to be looking for a communications issue somewhere, uh, particularly with the PCM, uh, but it can point you towards the right network as well. So since I can't test at the DLC because of my diagnostic can, uh, I want to do either uh, maybe an ohm check. In this case, I've got my U scope out and I just want to see what does the network look like, but I can't do it at the DLC, which is normally what I would do if I was hardwired in because I'm already sitting right there. I just reach under the dash and boom, I can test there. or I can put out my breakout box and do some testing, but I can't do that here because testing the diagnostic can isn't going to really help me a whole lot. And based on the fact that I can pull everything from the interior can, that should mean that my diagnostic can is working pretty well. Um, and heck, even if the diagnostic can was down, <laughs> it really wouldn't affect operation of the vehicle. As far as I know, it would just uh, limit you from being able to talk to anything with the scan tool. So anyways, we're moving on from that. I want to go after my can C. So I have to find a actual physical location on the car where I can tie into this network, where I can probe the network and see what's happening. And I decided in this case, uh, I was just going to go right to the tip -um. I figured this would be a good place to start testing because it's easy to access. I can pull this thing up just a few clips. I can see all the connectors and I can identify the color of these wires pretty easily as far as which network I'm trying to access. So I pull it up and I back probe the network. Everything's still plugged in and I'm just using my U scope and it, this looks really, really ugly on both sides. A CAN bus should be a nice clean square wave that goes from two and a half down to one and a half or two and a half up to three and a half, depending on if you're on the high or low side of the network. I had nothing like this. Uh, the voltage was very low and you could see some fluctuations going on, but it wasn't a square wave. Uh, it was just some hash and it was constant. It was there as long as the key was on, but it, this was not communication. Nothing, nothing was actually happening here. So now we need to decide what's happening with the network. It is something disconnected. You know, is the network open somewhere? Is it grounded? somewhere? Is it shorted to itself? Or is there another module that's causing problems on the network? So one thing we can do is an ohm check of the network. Now you have to do this when there's nothing present on the network. If you ohm check something with a voltage present on it, you're not going to get a good signal. So power down the vehicle or disconnect a battery and you can do an ohm check. You should expect to see 60 ohms on a high speed CAN network. 
Uh, they have two 120 ohm resistors in parallel. And this can tell you some things about the integrity of the network, not everything. Um, I had a discussion with somebody uh, just a couple weeks ago, you know, on the limitations of the ohm check for a network. And I, I definitely think it's useful and you want to, you know, consider all the possibilities when you're doing this, but it is one of the checks that I'm going to make as I'm looking at a network. So if I see 60 ohms, particularly on this network, what I can say is both modules that have the terminating resistors, and I don't know which ones those are. Um, I think one of them exists in the tip them, but Chrysler, as far as the service information and diagram goes, doesn't lay out the second module. But whatever that module is, it is connected to the network. If I get a good 60 ohms you know, from that ohm measurement. I know that both of those modules are plugged in. I don't know which ones those are on this vehicle, but I know they're plugged in. But I do know uh, that there is not an open between those modules. And I do know that the network is not shorted to itself. And again, this really depends on network configuration. So if I'm working on a GM this number actually means a little bit more to me because of how they daisy chain their network, meaning that the network wires go in on two wires on a connector on a module, and then another two wires go out to the next module. And communication goes both ways. But if you were to unplug a module in the middle of a network, let's say on a GM, you're going to kill everything downstream. You're going to disconnect everything downstream from that module in a physical sense, not in a data communication sense. And that ohm reading to me in a GM means a little bit more to me than it does in a Chrysler. But I still like to do it. I still like to see that 60 ohms. Um, you could still have a network that's shorter to ground. And that was one of the things that was pointed out to me here. So I'm not... 100% done here. Um, just because I see that 60 ohms doesn't mean necessarily that it's, you know, everything is, you know, physically intact in that network, but it's one step, it's one check that I want to make. I still have an ugly signal here. So now I need to decide on how I'm going to attack this network. And again, this is nine potential modules on this network. And this goes in the interior of the vehicle under the dash, also under the hood. It's a pretty big network. Uh, you know, do we have a circuit issue somewhere or do we have a module that is corrupting the data? Based on what it looked like, that was my, you know, initial thought. Uh, you know, we've got a lot of modules that are talking on a network. Um, in this case, again, there's nine of them. And when a module corrupts the data network, it causes the voltages to be all over the place. But I like to think of it as the drunk guy at the bar who's so drunk and yelling so loud that no one else can hear the conversations that they're trying to have. So, you know, we've got, we've got a module that's just uh, hammered and <laughs> he's, he's spouting off nonsense so loudly that the other modules cannot communicate properly. Uh, that's kind of what I'm thinking here. I can't rule out a circuit issue, but I have to decide on how I'm going to attack this problem. How am I going to identify where in the network or which module is a cause? Now, sometimes you can go through unplug modules one by one. That can be really challenging, especially on today's vehicles where we have so many modules in so many different locations and sometimes they're optional. And in this case, I have to decide, are, is this module even equipped on this vehicle? And it's hidden under the dash somewhere and I have to locate it if I just wanted to unplug it. Um, it might get to that point, but I like to be as efficient as possible in identifying where the problem is coming from in the network. So what I'm going to do is, and, and I've learned this from uh, training courses that I've gone to. This was not my, <laughs> I didn't come up with this by any means, but I have used it and it is uh, very effective when you have a hard fault in a CAN bus network or really, I mean, any network, but a CAN bus especially, and I'll explain why. What this is, is divide and conquer, okay? So when you have a large network, lots of modules, spans the length of the vehicle, and there's a hard fault, what we can do is actually separate portions of the network 
from each other and then repeat our testing to see is the problem gone or is it present on one side of the network and the other. So imagine if I had a whole network and a bus is just you know, a wire, I know CAN bus is two wires, but let's just say our network is one wire and it has multiple legs that go to multiple modules. If I could find a place in the middle of that network, okay, with all these different legs going off, and I could disconnect it, and then I could test the left side and I could test the right side, this is just our imaginary network here, I would be able to say that everything on this side of the network looks the way it's supposed to or close to it and everything on that side of the network that's our ugly signal so now effectively you know in a perfect world i've <laughs> eliminated half of the, well, not only the network but half of the modules as the cause and i don't need to go after those ones and here's why this works pretty well on most can bus systems i can't say it works on everything because of uh, terminating resistance but on a lot of can networks this works really well because every module on the network is going to produce its own bias and its own signals, meaning that there's no master or slave modules on a CAN bus. They all produce a 2.5 bias voltage on both the high and the low, and the low is going to pull it down, the high is going to go high with it. But when I disconnect a module from the network, of course, it still needs power and ground, and that can be the limitation here. You need to make sure the connector you're disconnecting isn't killing power and ground to a module. That can get a little bit confusing, uh, but we can still do this. If I'm disconnecting that module from the CAN network, and then I scope the CAN lines coming out of that disconnected module, again, just the network, not power and ground, I should still see a signal. Now, it may not be perfect, and again, this is where the terminating resistance comes into play, but you should see something that closely resembles a clean CAN network signal out of a module, even though it's disconnected from the rest of the network. Uh, you know, there's some single wired networks where that's not the case. There needs to be a, you know, a master and a slave module that's commanding the other modules to talk or saying when they can talk. Not the case in a CAN bus. So, getting back to why this is effective, if I split the network in two, now I can look and see, are all the modules on this side able to put out something that closely resembles clean communication? In this case, it's going to be real clear to me because what I have on the network wires looks absolutely terrible. Nothing, nothing like a CAN bus signal, nothing even like a square wave. And so, I should be able to identify, even if it's not perfect looking, a change once I separate the network into different sections. So this again is where the diagram is really going to come in handy because we can identify some connectors within the system that are gonna allow us to separate different legs or portions or maybe even half of the network. Um, this is where the factory diagram actually came in handy as opposed to the redrawn color diagram that you would traditionally find in Mitchell. Because the redrawn diagram didn't include any connectors, they just had some splices in there, whereas the factory diagram actually had connector, um, where it says like C105 or 20 this or whatever, you know, connector it is, it actually showed it in the factory diagram. So that's helpful because now I can just look up the location of one of these connectors and I can decide which one's the easiest to get to and what modules will I be separating off of the network. So I picked connector CO5 as a good starting place. And CO5 is really easy to get to. It's right in front of the master cylinder. Um, so I'm almost there immediately, you know, because I was testing at the tip of them. I'm about a foot away from this connector. And what that connector is going to separate off of the network is the PCM and the tip them. And so everything else will still be on um, one side of the network, uh, which includes the ABS under the hood and then everything else, which is in the interior of the vehicle. So my idea is here is, yes, I still might have an ABS as an issue, but that everything else under the dash of the vehicle, in the interior of the vehicle, I can either eliminate it or say that's the direction I'm going. And 
again, besides the ABS, because the ABS was on the other side of this connector, I can almost eliminate everything under the hood. Um, and it's kind of pointing me in a direction. Do I need to go under the dash or should I stay under the hood? So I disconnect connector uh, 105, which again is in front of the master. And, and you do want to be careful here because disconnecting a connector like this, you do have the potential of killing power to modules and that can really mess up your diagnosis. But in this case, it worked out well for me because here's what I saw on the TIPM and PCM side of the network, which is again, almost everything under the hood besides the ABS, it still had that ugly signal that I did not want to see. But on the interior side, on the ABS plus the uh, interior control modules like airbag control mod, transmission control module, the anti-theft module, shift lever, steering angle, occupant classification, that actually cleaned up to look like a pretty good square wave that you would expect from a CAN network. It's what I wanted to see. So this is actually ended up being a really good test because now I know I'm under the hood somewhere and the only two modules that I really have to deal with are the TIPM and the powertrain control module. Everything else at least from what I can see on the network here, looks really good, okay? So I just got lucky in picking the correct connector. I picked it because it was easy to get to, um, but I picked the right one that happened to show me, you know, the leg or the section of the network where my problem exists. So now I have to decide, is this a circuit issue, uh, you know, something happening there, or is it a control module that is corrupting the data network? So I start with my PCM and what I did here was I just unplugged the PCM real quick. This might not be the way you want to go and I'll explain why, but in this case, I just wanted to see what happens. I'm still scoping my data network right at the tip. -um. I unplug the PCM, same thing, uh, same nasty signal that I don't want to see on that leg of the network. Okay, so I'm kind of down to circuitry, maybe somewhere under the hood, or the TIPM itself. That's really all I have left. So I want to eliminate the TIPM as a possibility. Now I can communicate with this thing uh, using my scan tool, but there is still a potential that this could be polluting the high speed portion of the network. This is kind of where it's tricky uh, in order to, dis to disconnect the TIPM from the rest of the network. And the reason being is when we unplug something like, like a TIPM, which is the fuse box under the hood, this is the power distribution center of the vehicle. If I start just unplugging things from the TIPM, not only am I going to take the TIPM off the network, but I could also be disabling a lot of other control modules. I could be killing a lot more of the vehicle if I just start unplugging things. And that's where doing this on a module like a TIPM or like a BCM on a GM can be really, really tricky in order to just unplug it. And I, I just don't think that's the way to go here um, because of all the circuits that this thing powers. You know, we could we could affect something else by unplugging this. And I don't want to do that here, but I still want to take the TIPM off the network and see, you know, what does the network look like? So here's what I did. I found the two wires where the high speed bus enters into the TIPM through the connector. There's just two wires. And what I did is I actually depinned them. So I pulled these two pins out from the connector of the TIPM. Basically just taking the TIPM off of the high speed network only leaving everything else plugged into it. And I also plugged the PCM back in and I connected C105, which is my connector to go to the interior of the vehicle. And I scoped right at those two lines, the high speed bus that w they were plugged into the tip them. They're not anymore. And I have a great signal, not perfect, but it looks like a square wave. It looks like communication. So effectively what I've done is I've disconnected the TIPM from the system without completely disabling it. And I know for sure that the TIPM is causing the issue here, that it is corrupting the data network. So is it a TIPM? Now these things obviously fail all the time. We do want to make one more check, or maybe I should say checks 
to make sure that you're not missing a power or a ground to a control module. I have had modules where I have either lost a power or I have lost a ground or maybe not had a sufficient power or ground that will end up causing them to pollute the data network. I had a GM TCM where this was the case. The ground was missing and it was causing the module to spout nonsense onto the data network. So before you condemn a module, you always want to make sure that all the powers and grounds are good. So I went through my checks and I loaded all the powers and grounds using a headlight bulb. They're all good as far as what I can tell. So it's going to be a tip them. So I tell the shop, replace the tip them. Um, if you get a new one, which I definitely recommend on these Chryslers, don't go used. It's just a mess. If you get a new one, you actually don't have to program them. You plug it in, turn the key on, the blank tip them from the factory will actually relearn everything on the car. Um, it will you know, look at all the options and you'll be good to go. Uh, one other thing I should mention on these and the Jeeps of this era, <laughs> and I'm sure many of you know this, but uh, I've gotten some calls from shops before on this. You install the new tip them and everything's good. The problem's fixed except for uh, there's no communication with the airbag control module and there's an airbag light on the dash. Uh, there are two fuses that are in a yellow holder. When you get a new tip em, you need to actually push these fuses down into place uh, when you install it. It's part of the installation, and those fuses are for the airbag system. And you can't really tell because they're in this plastic holder, um, and I think there's even instructions in the box, but who reads those? Um, so make sure you push those down or you won't have communication with the airbag control module. But shop replaced the tip on, did all that stuff, and it was all good to go. We cleaned up our data network, talked to everything. Uh, we're all good to go. So uh, hopefully you enjoyed that. Hopefully you learned something from that case study. Lots of good information in there. But thank you so much for listening. But other than that, let's get out there and start fixing the world one car at a time. Thank you.